indigenous urban folks and really just acknowledging the land that we're on and that we're all coming from all across Turtle Island and acknowledging the forever history of this land. Also really want to acknowledge that uh, myself and my colleagues were here as settlers. We work in the Shangwak Residential School Center. Really grateful to be working with the Children of Shangwak Alumni Association, survivors and intergenerational survivors from the Shangwak Residential School. And it's really their decades of work that um, we're working with and really grateful to acknowledge their work. Um, likewise, I do want to just port out some health support resources uh, because we are talking about residential schools. We're gonna be showing a couple images from residential schools and recognizing that talking about this history can be emotional, it can be triggering, and really wanting to encourage people to take the space and the time that they need. Um, and we've included the National Residential School Crisis Line and the Hope for Wellness Crisis Line on the screen as well. Okay. So I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Jana, to get us started. So my internet <coughs> is really choppy, Kristen and Maddie, so if I cut out, if you wanna take over, <coughs> please do. Um, so there's various different types of uh, records related to residential schools that you can be looking for um, when you're looking for information about somebody who attended residential school. Uh, so these include photographs and these can be photos from both staff and students at the residential school. Um, yearbooks and newsletters are a really great resource. Um, there's also newspapers, um, so newsletters are um, like essentially newspapers that are published by the school and then newspapers are kind of the general um, more public newspapers. There's also attendance records and quarterly returns that have information on students and when they attended the residential school. And um, there's administrative records and so these can be various different types of records from staff at the residential school. And then there's also the RG10 record series. And so this is the records created by the uh, Indian department, the Canadian government. And so those are held at Library and Archives Canada and encompass um, some of those attendance records and administrative records as well. There is a lot of challenges with searching through these residential records. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of the records are incomplete. So we have attendance records for a lot of schools, but not for every year that the school was open. Sometimes there'll be a gap of just one or two years that's missing. Sometimes there'll be a larger gap that's missing. It really varies school to school and year to year. Um, as well as other records, um, there is a lot of poor record keeping related to residential schools. Um, so not everything was kept. Um, so you may be looking for somebody and there could be a big gap in the years that they attended uh, and we just don't have those records anymore. There's also a lack of student names on photographs. Um, so there's tons of photographs, uh, again, from various different sources of students at residential schools, but a lot of them aren't labeled. Um, so the people who took the photographs may have put some names on the back or may have just put more general information and didn't identify everybody in there. Um, so uh, we do work to try and disseminate photographs and get identifications. Um, so as you can see in this photograph here, um, there are some names written on there in pen of people who just pointed to individuals in the photograph to try and get them identified. But that's not the case for every photo. We have lots of photos uh, and I'm sure lots of other um, repositories have photos that aren't fully identified. There's also uh, records uh, located in many different archives. Um, so there's residential school focused archives like ours. Um, there's church archives, government archives. There can be records in local archives as well. So there can be many different um, repositories that you need to search through. So we'll talk about those uh, a bit more in a moment, but these are some of the kind of challenges that you can face when you're searching for residential school records. So to gather information for your search, uh, it's important to have as many of these as you possibly can. If you have a few that like you're missing some, it's not a huge deal. It's all, you can often find things that will, little breadcrumbs that will lead you to places otherwise. But 
Um, the main thing is a name or alternate spellings or nicknames of the person that you're trying to find records for. Um, so if you know maybe their their given name or the name they chose to want, chose to go by, um, oftentimes with more common with women, but the maiden name is a lot more helpful in these scenarios. Um, their approximate date of birth, even if you don't know their birthday, maybe the year they would have been, how old they would have been when they attended residential school and maybe like the year that they attended. Uh, the school they attended, if possible, I know this one isn't uh, common all the time just because of miscommunications and things like that. And even their community name. So a lot of the uh, quarterly returns for residential schools included the community that the person was from. So you can often start narrowing things down from that way if you have not much else to go on. Yeah, so we're going to talk through and show some examples of searching some of the common places you can look for residential school records. So the three of us work at the Shamwalk Residential School Center. Uh, we're located in Balatang, Sault Ste. Marie. Um, and this archive was initially started to collect records around the Shinwalk Residential School. It has since expanded to collect records relating to residential schools all across the country, so not just Shinwalk. I'd say our collections are definitely strongest in Ontario and Northern Quebec, um, but we do have information relating to residential schools in other parts of the country as well. The one of the other major places that folks can look is the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. So this is the archive and center that was set up when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, concluded its work. And it holds a huge repository of information relating to residential schools all across Canada. And it really collected information from archives all across the country. Um, not all of the information they have is available online, um, but there is ways that you can request records, especially if you're a survivor or an intergenerational survivor. There is a way you can request your own records or records of a family member. Um, likewise, UBC's Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center is another kind of large center that's specifically focused on residential schools. Uh, this center's focus is, and strength really is on the BC residential schools. They, they do have information related to some of the other Western Canada schools as well. But I know I saw in the chat there's a few folks who are located in BC, and this is a resource that I would really recommend starting with. They have a really good search interface that makes it easy to locate schools and kind of find information uh, from there. There are a couple other places that hold archives related to residential schools, so Library and Archives Canada. Library and Archives Canada also has some information related to Indian Day schools. Likewise, the Anglican Church General Synod, the Grey Nuns Archives, and other religious archives all hold information connected to residential schools. As part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Anglican Church, as well as the other church is involved in residential schools, had to provide copies of, of their records to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. So if you go to the NCTR, they should have those copies, making it a little easier so you don't have to go to all these separate church repositories. There is a question in the chat really quick. Uh, what is the process for requesting records as a survivor or an intergenerational survivor? Uh, so it partially depends on which archive you're looking at. Um, and I can show, um, so our process, if Maddie, you wanna put our email in the chat, it's really just, uh, you can email us and we can help start that search process. For the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, there is a form to fill out. Uh, likewise, with the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center and General Synod Archives, um, you can just contact them directly. And so I'll go through kind of some searches on their websites, as well as showing you how to um, access what's there. Um, so kind of our plan is I'm going to look across a couple different archives. So I'm starting with the... 
Kingwalk Residential School Center archives. And um, we're going to search for the same family across three different archives and use that as a way to kind of show you why it might help to look in different places. So we're going to look for the Kakaji family. This is a family that we work really closely with in the Shingwak Residential School Center. Uh, their survive survivors from the Kakaji family are really involved in the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. Um, so if I hit search here, you can see there's actually a lot of records related to the Kakaji family. Some of them are oral histories. I can also narrow it by um, graphic material, which is photographs, textual records, audio records, and there's even some video. Um, in part, I know this is because the Kakaji family has been really involved with the children of Shingwak. Um, so they've been identified in a lot of the photographs. Um, so here, I just clicked on the first search result. See, that there's a photo that has Marjorie Kakaji in it. Go down to the bottom. We can see Marjorie down at, there as well. You could also scroll down, you can see there's a few other uh, members of the Kakaji family that came up here. So some of Ernie, some of Jimmy, and uh, as well as Mike Kakaji. Um, so kind of a range of information. If you were looking for a specific member of the family, you could enter their name as well as the last name to try and narrow things down. Um, I would say that for example, if you know they had a nickname, as Maddie was saying, you could enter that as well or if there's different spellings of the name. So uh, for example, one of the people who came up was Mike Kakaji uh, in the residential school records. He often was named Michael. So making sure that you're searching by both of those is one example. I'm just gonna close a tab and move us over to the Anglican Church website. Um, so this is anglican.ca slash archives, and to look through their collections, you just click on search our collections. I'm going to do the same search over here, if I can spell their name right. So here, there's way fewer records that have come up. There's actually only four. Um, and so there's a photograph that has Ernie Kakaji in it. And then there's another photo that has Marjorie Kakaji in it. Um, and then there's two kind of newspaper articles that both mention Mike Kakaji. Um, so some photographs as well as some more contemporary news articles in this case. Um, so you kind of see the difference between the two repositories here. One of the nice things about this one is the photos display right away. You don't have to click through. Um, so you can see them immediately. And if you want to see the photo bigger, it is possible to do so just by clicking on it. And then it can be a full page image. So this is the, I've just switched over to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And their website is organized by school. Um, so it's actually organized in a map. So you can either go by province um, and click on the school name, or you can use the map itself and click over onto the school. Um, so I know the Kakaji family attended both St. John's and Shingwok. So if I wanted, I could just browse through those images. So clicking on Shingwok or clicking on Chaplow and then scrolling through to see if I come across any records from that time period. You can also search the records by name or by keyword. So I'm gonna do that to kind of narrow things down. Okay, so here 
you can actually see that the two images that we saw on the Anglican Church website are here as well. And so I think it's really important to recognize that this is an example of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation collecting material from archives all across the country. So it kind of shows you, you don't need to search some of those other archives that you should be able to find it here. Um, so in addition to the photos here though, there are a number of textual records and a lot of what is coming up is what is known as quarterly return records, which are also known as attendance records. Um, so this one is from the Moose Factory Residential School. Uh, in 1948. So I'm just going to click on the record itself so I can show you what they look like and we can talk through how to read a quarterly return record. Um, so as I mentioned, these records are essentially attendance records. Uh, often not in alphabetical order. They are usually divided though into girls and boys and it usually lists the student's name, the age of the student, uh, the community that they're from, as well as what class or grade that they were in. It might also list, for example, a trade or skill that they were doing at residential school. Um, it also sometimes has the date that they entered the residential school. Um, and so this can be a really important resource for anybody who's looking about information for themselves or a family member, because it can provide a lot of that contextual details, um, sometimes a little bit more than just a photograph can. Um, so I kind of pre-looked and I think it's page four, page five that the Kakaji family was on. Yeah, so down at the bottom, uh, there's Charles and Mike Kakaji. Um, so kind of giving you an idea, um, again, of how these records can be helpful, um, showing the two family members, their ages while they were at the Moose Factory Residential School, uh, what grades they were in. They both entered the residential school in July, on July 8th, 1948. Um, so this quarterly return is actually from the first year they would have been at the Moose Factory Residential School. And if we think back to the um, list of records for the Kakaji family, there's a lot of quarterly returns. So the quarterly returns were usually done every four months. And so you could look through each of these to find um, records from each year the students were at the residential school. Um, particularly, also, so, sorry, go ahead if you want to finish. Um, <laughs> particularly if you know maybe when they left the residential school, the last quarterly return sometimes has information about what they did when they left the residential school, or it might note that when they left the residential school exactly, like the discharge date, um, or have information about like what grade they were at when they left. Yeah, Jenna, sorry. Yeah, that's kind of what I was going to touch on, just that some of the quarterly returns have like a note section. And so it might give more information about um, when they arrived at the school, what they were doing at the school. Um, sometimes it has information like this one is a great example, admitted to hospital, it has information like that. Um, or like Krista said, it might have more information about um, what they did after they left the school. These ones in particular don't have it, but some schools also have the parents' names. Um, so if you're using it kind of like for genealogical information, um, it's a great resource for that. If you don't know um, the person uh, you were looking for, if you don't know what their parents' names are, some records have that as well. So there's really a range of information that these quarterly returns have. So they're a really great resource to look at. Yeah, I would completely agree, Jenna. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get to the tabs at the top of my screen. Um, so there was a question about how to request records. Um, so on the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation site, at the very top, if you go to the archives tab and then access, it explains their access 
protocols, and it does have a section specific to survivors and intergenerational survivors. Um, so I will actually just pop that link in the chat so that if anybody wants to go to that page directly, they can. Um, there is also an email address directly, and there's forms for both survivors and intergenerational survivors there. Let's head back to our PowerPoint. So one more question. Um, oh. Ann asks, when I requested my records, most of the info was redacted. Sorry, my dog is being annoying. Uh, when I search for info at these sites, what will that be the case? Yeah, and so in the case of these sites, if it's on the website, it shouldn't be redacted. If it is information that's maybe medical information or uh, personal in that nature, it likely isn't on the website, but if you request them, they shouldn't be redacted, at least in, especially in the case of the Shanghawk Residential School Center, if you're requesting your own records, they wouldn't be redacted. I can't speak for the National Center on Truth and Reconciliation, but I know like the Anglican Church as well, they tend to give the records directly to the survivor. Um, so there are a few other places beyond the archives generally that it can have information related to residential school attendance. Um, and so, for example, census records are one example. Um, I'm going to use an example from the Shanghawk Residential School. The, I want to say the 1921 census um, actually included all of the students from the Shanghawk Residential School in the census. And so it lists their name and it says their residence is Shanghawk. Um, in the case of the records we hold for that residential school, we actually don't have very many records from the 1920s at all. Um, but by using the census records, able to uh, kind of confirm for families that yes, the relative did attend the residential school in that period. Jenna, do you want to talk a little bit more on this slide since I know you've been doing work with these materials? Yeah, um, so yeah, the, again, the census records are also a really great resource because they will say if somebody was a student or not. So even if the census um, was taken when they weren't at the school, like if they were home for a summer holiday, if they were allowed to go home, it still might say that they're a student and might say how long they've been in school for. Um, not every census record will have that information, but some of them do. Um, so you can always go and look at that. A lot of them also will have information about whether the person could read or write in English. Um, so that's a good place to check um, to see, you know, how far advanced they were in their schooling. Um, there is also just sort of the general information um, like age uh, that comes from those attendance records as well will also be in the census records. Um, death records is another thing that is helpful, um, especially if the person you're looking for passed away while they were in residential school. The death records will have that kind of information where they were living when they passed away. Um, sometimes the death records have information about where they're buried as well. Um, so if a student passed away at a residential school, it's likely that they're buried at the cemetery at the residential school. But sometimes they weren't. Sometimes the bodies were sent back home. Um, so that's a good place to check for information if you're wondering uh, about where somebody is buried. The death records also have information sometimes about cause of death. Um, so if it was an accident or if it was illness, uh, it'll have information like that. It'll usually have their age. It might list their home community. Um, just kind of depends on the year and depends on the death record. Also depends on um, how much information the staff person and knew the staff person who was um, informing about the death um, because that's where the death record gets their information from, uh, from the person who's informing about the death. So the staff person didn't know a lot of information. The death record might not have a lot of information, um, but sometimes it does have quite a lot of information. So that is a really great resource as well. It also uh, really oh. Sorry, go I was just basically going to go to the last point. Like, always contact us um, for help in searching and interpreting these records because um, sometimes the census record is <laughs> like looking at this it's very dense with information it's kind of hard to interpret sometimes so if you find a record and you're not really sure what exactly it's saying you can always contact us and ask for help in interpreting it. I'd also say likewise like 
if you're trying to find an archive on a website or a record on an archives website and you just aren't having any luck, reach out to the staff, I'd say is a really good step. You know, particularly at the center here, like that's one of our top priorities is helping people connect with records related to themselves or family members. And so we're definitely happy to help with that search. Um, so I think I'm going to leave the PowerPoint there and I've seen a few questions come in through.